Delena Ashley Young Gonzalez. Xiao Xiao Tan. Dao Yu Feng. Paul Andre Michaels. Soon Park. Hyun Jung Grant. Young Yu. And Soon Cha Kim. They are why we are here today. I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. I'm Robbie Reddy, the Associate Director for Advocacy and Policy at the Asian American Federation. We represent the collective voice of more than 70 nonprofits serving 1.3 million Asian New Yorkers. We're all here today because we are in pain and we are angry. Members of our community were murdered in cold blood on Tuesday. They were Asian, they were women, they were elders and they were matriarchs. They were immigrants working towards a better life. We're here because the Asian American community is once again forced to reckon with our vulnerability and our mortality within our communities, within our workplaces, continually worried that the racist, sexist stereotypes forced upon us may be acted upon violently at any moment. We're here because this is visceral, because this is personal for every single one of us. As we build community tonight, we'll hear from leaders and community organizations who are doing the hard lift of keeping our community safe. And we'll be around to continue the work after Tuesday's tragedy becomes a memory, becomes a part of our collective memory, a part of our story and our history. We'll also be hearing from performers who have made an art of giving voice to the oppressed, to the voiceless and the traumatized. It's also important that this space be one for all of us to be able to express ourselves. In an e effort to that end, we'll be having 15 to 20 minutes at the end of this vigil for attendees to step up to this mic and speak for a couple minutes each to speak their truth, to express their feelings on what has happened to us. But before we get started tonight, I want us to present with the emotions we're bringing to this vigil and to consider the families who have only just begun to live in a world without their loved ones with a moment of silence. With that, I'd like to introduce our executive director if she is here. If not, we are th not quite yet, but we are thankful to have with us the pastor of the United of the Morningside United Methodist Church, Pastor Charles Rue, a Korean American immigrant and a real life member of our family, to open this peace vigil with some words of spirituality. Thank you all for coming out this evening. Our emotions are very high and intense that words fail to express properly. Yet we are here to honor the victims of the heinous crime, that of racism, misogyny, and as a community resolve to rise up and show the world what a healing and transforming community of justice and love and peace we all are. I'm so glad that we began with a silent moment. Uh, let me intone a chant for their eternal rest and continue on with my prayer tonight. Though I am a Christian pastor, speak Christian language, I'm sure all of you who are of different spiritual and wisdom tradition uh, can translate into your own language as well. If you would, if it's not inconvenient, if you could, in your mind or physically hold your hands together, even bow a little bit. Very Asian gesture of peace, nonviolence, and goodwill. Into your hands, O oh merciful Savior, 
we commend these your eight servants, the seven of them women of Asian descent, who perished in Atlanta. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, sheep of your own fold, lambs of your own flock, sinners of your own redeeming. Receive them into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious of company of the saints of light. Amen. 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 Oh God, we also now lift up our prayer for the sole survivor, Elsias Hernandez Ortiz. May him be healed and recover and provide the world with important eyewitness. And now God, we lift up the families of these eight sacrifices and also the families of all who have been killed by hate crimes of all kinds throughout the land. Grant them your divine comfort in the midst of unbearable pains they are going through now. Grant that all their needs for their survival and stability will be provided by the outward and concrete expressions of love and care from the surrounding communities and all of us so that their pain, anger and hopelessness will be transmuted into hope, resolve and new creation by the deep experience of love. We call upon you, God, to help the perpetrator of the, this heinous crime to acknowledge his sins and repent so that even he could receive the grace of reform, become a new creature and no longer under the bondage of sins of hatred, racism, misogyny, white supremacy and cowardice of gun violence. May he repent, O oh God. We call upon you, O oh God, to challenge the Christian churches, liberal and conservative, to repent of their sins of complicity and inaction and not confronting the sins of this nation that we all love, the sins of white racism, white supremacy, sins of misogyny, the sins of income inequality, and the sins of unequal judicial system. May this church repent and be born, reborn to practice first and teach that all the people in this land and all of the world may know that it is your will, O oh God, that everyone, all the children ever born in this land, on this earth, are precious to you. And we are to give full dignity and full humanity to all, and we are to become our sisters and brothers keepers. We pray for our Asian American community. We know and claim once again that we as Asian Americans matter to you, O oh God. No matter how much we are rendered invisible and statistically insignificant by the majority of the land, and this land would rather erase us even by killing us, but we matter to you, O God, and we are precious, precious to you, O God. That's why your spirit is blowing through the whole Asian America now in solidarity with our black, brown, and native sisters and brothers to rise up together to demand justice, heal, and transform this land. You are empowering and guiding us to reclaim our rightful places in this land, celebrate our heritages and contributions, claim our resilience and setting up for our thriving in this land for when we Asian Americans do well, when all the people of Carlos do well, all the rest of America will also do well the meaningful and lasting world peace with justice will be more within our grasp. We know that your reign on this earth is coming just as it is, it is already done in heaven and you will wipe away all our tears for this world will manifest full embodiment of your, of your peace, your justice, your love among all the peoples for all other peoples. Make this vision of yours for all the peoples so plain and clear to everyone that we 
eagerly join your spirit that is already building a new society, a new human community in our midst. It is happening even now as we are gathered this evening here at Union Square. Heal us, O oh God. Make us whole, O oh God. Empower us and guide us, O oh God. We acknowledge that you are with us and we are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for those poignant words, Pastor. Anti-Asian xenophobia and the violence at its roots is a neighborhood, city, state, and federal issue. It's an issue of relationships between us as citizens, and it's a policy issue. It'll require work amongst ourselves, but it'll also require holding elected leaders and office holders at every level, in every position of power, accountable to our needs and the needs of the most vulnerable in our community, especially right now, when we are collectively grieving for those of our own. This work is as much about holding ourselves accountable as it is holding those in power accountable. To that end, I'd like to invite our senior senator, Charles Schumer. Thank you, Robbie. First, our hearts ache. They ache for the families of those who were lost to the brutal slaying in Atlanta. Our hearts ache to the so many, unfortunately so many Asian Americans who have been assaulted and brutalized over the last year. Our hearts ache for the millions of Asian Americans who walk down the street looking over their shoulders, wondering if someone might be doing harm to them as they walk down the streets and go into their homes. This Asian American community is the best of America. The best of America. People who work hard, love their families, create businesses, join churches, and make our country and our city so wonderful and we say to the bigots you will not prevail unfortunately over the last four years we have had a president who see who too many people when they listened to him thought bigotry was okay even violence was okay but now he is no longer president and we the people of america of every, every different background and philosophy and race and creed and gender and orientation come together and say, we will not let bigotry prevail against Asian Americans or any American. We know that violence and bigotry against one is violence and bigotry against all. We stand firm. We stand firm. We speak to the better angels of America. We say we love you, we love everybody. We are against violence and will fight violence with every inch of our, with every atom in our bones. And we, not the bigots, not those who are violent, will win this fight and prevail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator, for making the time to be here with us. The energy of sadness and anger, but also of resolve and determination, it's palpable here. It's palpable here. In so many ways, the spiritual words we heard from Pastor Ryu, the, the words we heard from the Senator, really spoke to us. They, they naturally lead us to poetry. Our next speaker is an artist, 
the 2020 New York Foundation for the Arts Fellow, just one of many fellowships that she has received. She has shown what it means to speak truth to power, to, see, to speak from a place of experience and intersectional identity, to speak honestly and vulnerably, and in this moment, with all of you together sharing in these circumstances with us, it's my sincerest honor to pass the mic to Cindy Tran. The only thing I'll say about this poem is that I wrote it about five years ago, about the previous 10 years of my life. So this is sort of about the past 15 years, but probably more. True American sentences. One, he looks at my name tag and asks, what's your real name? I tell him that Cindy is what's printed on my birth certificate. What's your middle name? My, I knew it was in there somewhere. Two, on Franklin Avenue, he bumps into me and says, watch where you're going. Three, I stand at a bus stop and an old man turns to me. I fought in them, you're here because of me. Four, on Grand, he bumps into me and shoves me to the side. Five, in an Ikea parking lot, I yield. He signals me to roll down the window of my U-Haul truck, laughs, not too bad for an Asian woman, and speeds away. Six, on University Avenue, he bumps into me and says, you're in my way. Seven, in his office. I hear my therapist call me beautiful and call himself colorblind. He says my anger at him is really anger at my parents. He calls this transference. Eight, on Broadway, he bumps into me and says, didn't see you. Nine, my friend has brain cancer and enrolls in a clinical trial. He asks if I would sleep with him before he dies. When I say no, he asks if I have any Asian friends who could help him. 10. On Central Avenue, he bumps into me and says, bitch. 11. A friend lends money to help me move to college. Halfway through paying him back, he says he can't help but feel like I owe him something else. 12. My mentor encourages me to embrace my youth and pursue writing. After I turn 21, he asks if he could take nude photos of me. 13. I stand in the aisle at the end of a Delta flight. There's no room in front of me. There's no room behind me. A man gets up and discovers room above my shoulder for his elbow, room in front of my rib cage for his carry-on, and room above my toes for his Oxford. I say, ouch. He says, well, excuse me. 14, no, is a miracle word that cured him of his brain cancer and kept saving my life. 15, last week I heard a woman say, I will only ever be someone's first Asian girlfriend and I felt power. 16, Every time a white man went out of my life, my life got better. 17. Every time a friend stands up for herself, 
I feel her power bring me back to life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy. Those words really, really hit home in a number of ways. Let's give her another round of applause, shall we? And now it's my pleasure to introduce my boss, the the leader of our organization, uh, Joanne Yu. Joanne! You guys, thank you so much for coming out. Um, it's not easy to ask for the community to get together during a global pandemic. I'm gonna try to do this without crying. Thank you all so much for coming and being with us today to bear witness to one of the nightmares that have come to life. To be a woman, to be an immigrant, to be Asian, to work during a global pandemic is to risk so much. Tuesday, a white supremacist drove to three different Asian spas and killed eight people. Six of them who look, look like me, looks like so many of us here. We're here because we all know that our community deserves better. Our workers deserve better. Our mothers, sisters, aunts, and daughters deserve better. We are here standing together because we are sad, we are angry, and we are exhausted by the roller coaster ride of emotions that we've all been dealing with today. Community, I want you to give yourselves a round of applause for just being here and just existing. Make yourselves be heard. Six of our sisters were murdered on Tuesday. Whether their murders are classified as hate crimes or not, our community knows hate, senses the hate, and worries because of the hate. These women, like all of us, embrace multiple identities as immigrants, as workers, as mothers and daughters, as aunts and sisters, as Americans. As a Korean American immigrant myself, this hits close to home. Six of our sisters were murdered on Tuesday as a leader of the Asian American Federation, tasked with making our, make sure, make sure our needs aren't forgotten and our voices heard in every conversation that concern our community's well-being, the ugliness of Tuesday hits hard. Six of our sisters were murdered Tuesday. Tonight, we'll process our anger and sadness together as a family and resolve to work together to make sure that our demands are heard and our community is invisible no more. I want to thank our friends who selflessly gave their time to join us. When we asked, everyone said, of course, we'll be there to stand together with you. That is how we build community. Six of our sisters were murdered on Tuesday. Let's never forget their names. Their senseless deaths that took eight dead people for our country to open their eyes to our pain. Thank you all so much. You guys, give yourselves a round of applause. Really big, big, big. Make your voices be heard so that nobody ever forgets that we deserve better. No more hate. 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 Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Joanne, for really setting the tone. I think with, with Cindy's words, with the pastor's words, with yours, um, I, 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 this is gonna be one very cathartic gathering. Uh, our next speaker, before he became state senator, started his political career as our city's first Asian American council member and our city's first Asian American elected to citywide office as our city's comptroller. He's been a critical voice at the state level for Asian American interests, speaking from his experience as a community leader and as an Asian immigrant himself. And it's my honor to introduce State Senator John Liu. Thank you all so much for being here. I've been called a lot of things in my life. I've been called Asian a lot. It's true, I'm Asian. I've been Asian my whole life. And a lot of people laugh when I say that. But I'm serious. And this past year, you know, 
When I grew up here in New York City, from when I was a young child, I got a lot of this nonsense. But now I'm in my 50s, I thought that most of this was in my past. But this past year has been surreal, really. The number of reports and incidents we have heard, people being avoided on the streets, in the stores, homes being vandalized, businesses and restaurants being boycotted, people getting disinfectant sprayed on them, told to go back to China. Are you gonna give me COVID? Maybe you should sit a little further away. People being shoved violently from behind. It's getting sent to the hospital. People having their faces slashed on the subways. And now we see this killing spree. It wasn't in our city, but it could very well have been right here in New York because we have been witness to so many incidents this past year. And, you know, we're here to gather to mourn the loss of these sisters in Atlanta. They, it is almost, and I really hope, I really hope this is the culmination of the hate and bigotry that Asian Americans have faced. I pray that there will not have to be another vigil in this seemingly never ending spate of hate against Asian Americans. But we know these things will continue to happen until we speak out more and more. That's why we're gathered right here in Union Square in the middle of New York City. We're here to say our hearts and prayers are with those victims and their families. And we are also here to say that we want justice. We want justice not for revenge purposes. We want justice so that this doesn't keep happening over and over and over again. You know, I don't, that killer who took eight lives. And by the way, people say, oh, most of them were Asian American. That killer was only looking for Asian Americans to kill. But for me, it's even worse. The response from government, from that sheriff's office, to not immediately say this was a hate crime. Because it damn well was a hate crime. This killer took a, drove miles and miles, got out of his car, calmly, as showed in the videos, had his gun, and went into an Asian business looking to kill Asians. And then he did it again. Drove to another Asian business to kill more Asians, and then yet a third Asian business to kill Asian Americans. And there's a question as to whether this is a hate crime? That is absolutely outrageous. This is the kind of thing that continues the violence and attacks against Asian Americans all across this country. And then for the sheriff to somehow excuse this person by saying, oh, he had a bad day. And that he was trying to address his sex addiction. I mean, this is from the sheriff's office. <laughs> further, an arm, an agency of government further marginalizing and objectifying Asian Americans, specifically Asian American women. How can we let this stand? That sheriff's office got to go. This is what we need to do to not only bring justice for those women killed in Atlanta, but to prevent this ongoing violence against Asian Americans. We're not invisible. We are not chinks. We are not. We are not gooks. We are not. We are not COVID. We are not. And we are not a virus. We are not. We are human beings. And it's not only these heinous attacks that we have seen. 
far more thousands of incidents, some of which I described earlier. But right here in New York, just a couple of days ago, earlier this week, a 13-year-old boy trying to play in the park, just a few blocks from my house at Bound Park, had the same kinds of attacks against him. Basketballs being thrown at his head, being told to go back to China, don't give us COVID. And that hasn't been covered because it's been overshadowed by these killings. But I'm not going to let that get swept under the rug. And as much as we have, so many of us have been told to go back to China. I mean, if I had a, a nickel for every time that somebody said that to me in my lifetime, I'd be in a warm place. <laughs> but this week, a New Yorker from a prominent family was caught on video. A video clearly yelling obscenities at a young Asian American woman t telling this, this, this white New Yorker, telling this Asian American woman to go back to China. Actually, the words on the video were go back to fucking China. And after two days of dogged reporting by one of our journalists here, and I'll give him credit, Stefan Kim from Channel 7. He wouldn't let it go. And I want to give a shout out to our Asian American journalists because, you know, a lot of times they, they face... They face resistance in their own newsrooms. But the issue here is, this woman got caught on video. At first she said it, and then she realized she was doing something wrong. She started trying to cover her face, trying to not let people know who she was. And then once again, the response is worse than the action. Her response that, first her tirade against this Asian American, and then the response that, oh, no, it was all a misunderstanding. I mean, look at me. I've done so much for Asian Americans. I fought against China for the goodness of Tibet. I mean, this is, the response is absurd. But this is the kind of thing that we have to speak out against. And so I want to thank the Asian American Federation for bringing us all together. I want to thank all of our fellow New Yorkers and Americans for coming out. We are Asian American, we are proud, and we are loud. Thank you so much, Senator, for those words. I think it really encapsulates the anger that we feel here today. It's important to acknowledge the work that's being done, the experiences that we're jointly experiencing. And it starts here, in our neighborhoods and in our city. What happened in Atlanta hit so close to home because exactly as the Senator said, we continue to reckon with that violence here in our city, here on our trains, here in our communities, on our streets and our sidewalks. As we navigate this trauma, and share this space in mourning and resolve, our next speaker has been on the front lines of advocating for policies that include every invisible and marginalized community, including the Asian immigrant community. It's literally his job to stand up and speak for the public. Friends, public advocate Jumani Williams. Peace and blessings, everyone. Just really quick with everyone's permission, you can't hold hands, but can you touch somebody's elbow? Just touch elbows so everybody knows that they're not alone. Turn to somebody and say you're not alone. Tell them I see you. We together. When I look out, it's beautiful. I see Americans and I see New Yorkers. And sadly, what happened a few days ago, I said before and I'll say again, is the inevitable conclusion to white supremacy and racism. All right. Every single time. Yes. Not sometimes, every time. It is the inevitable conclusion when a president of the United States is allowed to say China virus and Kung flu and is encouraged. Oh, racist. 
It is inevitable conclusion when an American president is allowed to talk about how he grabbed women however he wanted to and was elected anyway. It's the inevitable conclusion when we treat white supremacy and racism like a simple policy difference. It's the inevitable conclusion when all of these things happen and seven million Americans vote and say, yes, please give me that some more. We have to be honest about the depths of white supremacy and hatred in this country. This is what happens is the inevitable conclusion when that bigotry is matched only with a country's demonic obsession with guns. And we have to be honest about that. Until we're honest about that, this will continue to happen. We have to be honest that people think you're only American depending on what the shade of your skin is and what your face looks like. I'm proud here because I see all of you a part of the better America that keeps us with some light in the darkness that understands no matter who you are, what you look like, who you love, who you worship, you are American. And no bigoted terrorists is going to take that away. There were eight people who were killed. Killed. They're dead. They will not be back in human form. And their family's horror has just begun. What I hope is that the media focuses more on those victims than they do on that racist terrorist that killed them. This is powerful what's here, and we have to continue to do it each and every time. But I also want to see behind the tweets, behind the prayers and thoughts, some action. Let's get some money into these community groups so they can push back on this hate that's happening here. We got the words, let's get some action, and let's get some money. If this is unacceptable by your tweet, put some money behind it because the words haven't stopped it yet. And the hate is still there. And it is just as American as apple pie. So stop saying this is not American, this is not us, because sadly it is American and it is us. But also American are the people who are right here who will keep us going in the direction that we need to go. I'm so proud to stand with each and every single one of you here, the Americans and the New Yorkers who spread the light in all of the darkness. And I want to end with this, so I've been ending this oh, as many times as I speak about this. A message to law enforcement from the black community. First, I want to thank Joanne and all of the Asian leaders who were screaming Black Lives Matter last summer. Thank you so much for that. And we are going to stand with you now. But a message to law enforcement from the black community. We are asking you, please, to treat unarmed black people the way you treat armed white people who have murdered people and who simply have had a bad day. That's all we ask. Just give us that. Thank you so much, Public Advocate Williams. Thank you. And could we could we get some space? I mean, this is about community, and and we have a lot of community here who need to see and hear. Thank you. So now, with those words kind of resonating and literally echoing throughout Union Square, I think you know we need to you know again reconcile with the fact that this is a community issue and a policy issue at the city level, at the federal level, and at the state level. Then our next speaker, I'm proud to announce, is the State Comptroller, Thomas DiNapoli. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you to the Asian American Federation for gathering us this evening. Thank you all for being here. You are witness. You are witness 
that peace is stronger than violence, that love is stronger than hate. We are coming together as a united community here in New York to say it is time to stop the violence, stop the hate, stop targeting our Asian brothers and sisters across this country. The violence has to end, the hate has to end. Enough is enough, enough is enough, enough is enough. I was moved by uh, my state colleague, Senator John Lu's passionate comments. And I reflected that a week ago, before what happened in Atlanta happened, John traveled out to my home community in Nassau County. And we had a similar gathering of Long Island residents to say that the anti-Asian incidents that were happening on Long Island, we had to stand up and speak out. John, did we think that a week later, we'd be talking about murder in Atlanta, right? You didn't mean it that way. <laughs> what John, the litany that John gave us is important to be reminded of. I won't repeat it. But we know the statistics. Right, Scott? That's what we do with the controller's office. We look at numbers. 700 reported anti-Asian incidents in New York City over the past several months. Reported. What John Liu pointed out is a reminder of how many incidents are not reported. How many more multiples of that 700, in fact, are happening in our streets each and every day? It, it is a disease. It is a sickness. So our being here, yes, is important. As Jumani, our public advocate, said, putting money behind policy and good intention is important. But let's also be vigilant in our neighborhoods. When we see something, say something, speak out. If you're a victim of an incident, reach out to law enforcement. I know people sometimes don't want to become a statistic, but that's the only way we're going to document and start to turn the tide against what's happening in our neighborhoods. Yes, we condemn the violence against those eight victims in Atlanta, the Asian American women particularly. They were targeted, that's clear. But we have to acknowledge in our beloved New York, city and New York State, it's happening here. Violence and assaults, be they physical or verbal, are targeting our Asian American brothers and sisters. We have to put an end to it. We have to speak out. We have to stand up. We cannot ignore it. Thank you for being here in solidarity. Let's leave this gathering united and resolved to do all that we can, not just with words, but with actions. Thank you, New York. Here's to better days for all of us. Thank you, State Comptroller at Annapolis. And yes, comptrollers do work a lot with data, but we are more than numbers, and the numbers only serve to back up the narratives that we experience, that we have heard, that we have lived, that we have suffered through, that we carry with us every day, that we mourn, that we've been mourning since Tuesday. It's not data and then the narratives. The data only serves to give context to the narratives that we feel. Next up is our city comptroller, Scott Stringer, to speak more about what we can do together. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm gonna be very brief because I do believe it's time for the community to speak and for a lot of elected officials to listen. Yes. Yes. It's time that we listen more we need it. and hear what you have to say. But I want to say this. We got to make sure anytime there's an attack on the Asian community, the city responds. Whether it's a vigil or doubling down on a community-led safety plan, we got to make sure we have your back. And I'm here to tell you tonight that New York City has your back. Because any time another community has been attacked and has felt this pain, you could look to your left 
you could look to your right, you could look in front of you, but the Asian American leadership has always been there for everybody else. And it's time that we are here for you, whether this attack occurs in Georgia, whether we have fighting in New York, and what we've seen in Washington, we must come together as one people for everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me an opportunity. Thank you so much. And I just want to say that if there's one thing we realized from the tragedy in, tragedy in Atlanta, it was that it was a demonstration of the forces arrayed against immigrant women today and every day. A reminder that to be a woman, to be an immigrant, is to risk everything. To be a sex worker. To, to be a sex worker, absolutely. To first fight to get here, and then fight to belong here. I'd like to introduce a woman who's been a vocal proponent for women's rights for years, who's lived in demonstration of the idea that women deserve a seat at every table. She's been on the front lines of this fight, demonstrating through her work that an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. From her work after 9-11 to her work with the Black Lives Matter movement. It's my, it's my honor to introduce our next speaker, who chose to spend her birthday evening with us, the Executive Director of Empower Change and the co-founder of Until Freedom, Linda Sarsour. Good evening, New York. Today, I don't stand before you as an activist. And I say to my dear Asian American sisters and brothers that I stand here before you as your neighbor. I went to school with you in Sunset Park. I played with you in the streets of New York City. And when the government decided that Arab Americans were white, I told them I wasn't white, I was Asian. I was West Asian. And I was welcomed into the arms of the Asian American community. I feel heartbroken because as a Muslim American, I know what it feels like to come from a community that is targeted for who you are. I've been to too many funerals and I've sat at too many bedsides of people harmed just for looking a different way, for being of a different faith. So I'm here today in solidarity with you. Our immigrant families, our parents came to these United States of America for a better life so we could have a better life. And our parents deserve to come home to us safely at night. They deserve to live in a country where they feel safe and can live with full dignity. The Asian American community is not experiencing discrimination for the first time. And I'm here to inform those who believe that Donald Trump introduced racism and discrimination to Asian people, that they need to learn their history. That's right. Asian communities have discriminated and have been discriminated against since they came to this country. That's right. Learn about the lynchings of Chinese. When they said they were going to ban the Muslims, I believed them because we excluded the Chinese and legislators in this country in our history sat back idly if not in fact participated in it. On this U.S. soil, we interned Japanese Americans. We stripped Japanese people from their homes and put them in concentration camps on this U.S. soil. So the authorization of Asian communities is part and parcel of these United States of America. So I am tired of the words. I don't need the thoughts and prayers and neither do our Asian communities. Yeah. Yeah. Our communities 
would not thrive without our Asian neighbors, without the entrepreneurship of our Asian neighbors. Every time there's a closed storefront in our neighborhoods, our Asian sisters and brothers open it up and bring back to the economies of the neighborhoods that we live in. They deserve safety. And what I came here to say to our Asian American sisters and brothers is that we are all we got. I do not put my safety in the safety of government, of elected officials. We are all we got. I'm asking you all to not be bystanders. When you are on a train station, standing at a bus stop, walking in the street, and you see someone saying something that you don't agree with, or assaulting someone, or trying to harm someone, intimidate someone, stand up, say something. Do not be a bystander. I commit to you that wherever I am, that I will stand up, that I will fight, that I will say what needs to be said and do what needs to be done so that you can live in a country, that your children can live in a country where they can be safe. But not only do I want them to survive, I want you to thrive in these United States of America. I'm gonna leave you with this quote. It's from an Aboriginal woman named Leela Watson. And she said, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come here because you believe that your liberation is bound up with mine, let us work together. My Asian sisters and brothers, my liberation is bound up with yours. And when you are not free, I am not free and no one is free. And so our collective liberation is bound up together. I'm calling on your elders and your leaders. Police are not a solution. Police are not the solution. Do not ask for more police and criminalization in our communities. Come to our mosques come to our leaders, reach out to your neighbors. We will protect you. We will protect each other. Solidarity and love to you all. Thank you so much, Linda. What happened in Atlanta is also a reminder that none of us are truly free without feeling safe. But as Linda reminded us, that power is in our hands. I see all of these phones, and those are tools to take back power when our community needs it the most. Oh, that's right. All right? The violent manifestation of the outsider narrative is nothing new to our community, and it's an unfortunate experience that we share with all immigrant communities. Nevertheless, organizations like our sister organization, the Hispanic Federation, have been on the front lines of this work, fighting with us to make sure that our immigrant communities are well represented and joining us in solidarity when tragedy reminds us that our shared future can never be taken for granted. I'd like to introduce the president and CEO of the Hispanic Federation, Frankie Miranda, to provide some remarks. Thank you very much. For over a year now, we have been warning about the daggers of anti-Asian American language, rhetoric, bigotry being spewed in center, certain media channels, state houses, and city halls, and most damagingly, by the previous White House occupant that doesn't even deserve to be named. The peddlers of division and hate have seized on COVID-19 pandemic to demonize and blame people of Asian descent for our national crisis. The targeted mur murders this week of eight people, including six women of Asian descent in Atlanta, shows yet again that hate and bigotry will lead to violence. I want to speak now to my Latino brothers and sisters. La Federación Hispana y su red de más de 300 organizaciones comunitarias se solidarizan con ustedes, nuestros hermanos y hermanas asiáticos, en este momento de crisis, porque también es nuestro momento de crisis. 
Las historias de nuestras comunidades de los Estados Unidos están profundamente entrelazadas. Cuando les atacan, también nos atacan a nosotros. Exigimos a los líderes de nuestra nación para que condenen enérgicamente el lenguaje y la retórica antiasiática para desplegar la ampliación de la aplicación de la ley para proteger a comunidades en todos los Estados Unidos. Es hora de responsabilizar a todos los líderes e instituciones de nuestra nación y poner fin esto ahora. The histories of our communities in the United States are deeply and powerfully intertwined with each other. When you hurt, we hurt. We call on our nation's leaders to forcefully condemn anti-Asian American language and rhetoric, to deploy law enforcement to protect Asian American communities, and to bring the full weight of the law to bear on the perpetrators of violence. It's time to hold every leader and institution in our nation accountable and put an end to this now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frankie. What you said is such a poignant reminder of how we can and must show up for ourselves and for each other. To that end, I just want to remind everyone to stick around if you can, if you can weather the chill, because at the end of this vigil, we'll be setting aside 15 to 20 minutes so that we can share this mic with attendees, so that we can share this mic and prioritize community voices so that you can speak your truth and how you feel and process together. I think right now is also a good time for some artistic expression. Jung Hee Kim is a director of the Korean Traditional Folk Song Foundation here in New York. She will first perform Guom Sinoi, a non-lyrical vocalization piece originating from traditional Korean shamanic practices as consolation for the soul. Her following act is Bonjo Arirang, which is the oldest version of Arirang in the Seoul region. Arirang is probably the most famous Korean song in the world, so I've been told. So please join us and sing along if you know the song. Doing <laughs> Thank you. 
Can we give her another round of applause? Thank you so much. So, as we navigate this trauma together and lean into our feelings and our resolve, our next speaker could speak to how intersectional all this work is, how intersectional all this work is going to be for our community, for us as individuals, even as we view this as a policy problem too. This work for all of us is a demonstration of vulnerability and putting that vulnerability into action. It's a project in processing community trauma and working towards healing. It's my pleasure to introduce the Director of Changing Frequencies, a cultural organizing project based in Brooklyn, Tara Page. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be here as an African-American, as a black queer woman who righteously fights against policies, legislation, action, and violence that are deeply rooted in colonization and the enslavement of all of our peoples. As I stand here before you as someone who's been fighting against yellow peril for three decades with organizers that are fighting against the fear, the anxiety, the, this ideology that presents that Asian people should somehow be, that are somehow seen as dangerous or as criminals. As a black person experiencing that same kind of pathology and exoticization, I stand here before you fighting with organizers as queer, trans, gender conforming people of color who are fighting for the identity as Asian, as black, as Arab, as Latinx, as people who believe that our queerness cannot be pathologized, that our bodies can no longer be criminalized, that we will not stand for the policing, the incarceration and detainment of our community. I stand before you in the belief that police, as Linda Sarsour always says, police are not who we can rely on for our collective safety and care. My safety depends on your safety. My care depends on your care bystander intervention, but also to intervene on the generational trauma that all of our people continue to experience. Yet again, Asian migrant women had to be on the front lines as the ones that were murdered to remind state officials, to remind the cops, to remind the United States government that Asian people are dying. Six months ago, New York City wasn't talking about anti-violence targeting Asian communities on the news. It was very minimal. Six months ago, we weren't talking about the rise of hate in relationship to how Black Lives Matter builds with Asian communities to understand colonization and white supremacy will come for all of us. So I wanna give a quote here by Gary Okahiro. 
that speaks to the kinship between Asian and black people. We are a kindred people, African and Asian Americans. We share a history of migration, interaction, and cultural sharing, a commerce and trade. We share a history of colonization, decolonization, and independence under neo-colonization. We share a history of oppression in the United States that successively has served us as slaves, as cheap labor, as peoples excluded and absorbed, as victims of mob rule and Jim Crow. We share a history of struggle for freedom and other democratization of America, of demands for equality and human dignity. We share a history as a kindred people. We are forging the fire to fight against white supremacy and struggle. I stand here with you with my Korean brother, Sewan, who's going to speak through drumming as we honor prayer, as we honor the vibration that moves us to the fire, to the freedom, to the struggle that we must build together to fight colonization and fight this idea that we don't deserve to exist. She's got a sign and decided to show off. Anyways, can we give them another round of applause, please? Yeah. Thank you so much, and, and it's just such a testament to the energy here that we can have the, the, the speeches that we've heard, the viewpoint that we've heard expressed, the music and the poetry and the expression that we felt here today. In that, on, in that vein, it's my honor to call upon Minister Christian John Foy of the Ark of Justice, who has been one of the fiercest and loudest voices in the social justice arena. Minister Foy? No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! What do we want? Justice! What do we want? Justice! What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! When do we want it? Now! When do we want it? Now! I've come tonight for two purposes. 
First, to honor those who have been robbed from us. To honor their shed blood and sacrifice. And to uphold their humanity. And the second reason I've come is to speak about two things, love and power, love and power. Throughout the history of this nation, we as people of color have paved the streets in our blood. We have hung from trees. We have been laid out across railroad tracks. We have been hunted and shot down like wild animals. And we have done it at the hands of white supremacy. The enemy can be counted on two things. First, always revealing himself. And second, always picking the wrong victims. We have hung separately and we have bled separately. But today, our blood is mingled together in the streets of America. And now, white supremacy has awoken another giant. So I have come as a black man to stand together with my Asian sisters and brothers. One giant community bound together in love with another giant community to speak truth to power. We've heard all of the rhetoric that is necessary. Now it is time to speak truth to power. It is time for us collectively to decide the fate of this nation. It is time for us collectively to decide the leadership of this nation, of this state, of this city. It's time for us to stop being bamboozled and divided by white supremacists that can only survive while we are on our knees. Collectively, we determine the fate of this nation. Collectively, we determine the fate of humanity. And as long as we do not allow white supremacy to divide and conquer two great giant people, we will take America from her dark past and our dog present into a brighter future. But only if we do it together. Right. Only if we stop seeing color and start seeing kind. Only then can we confront white supremacy in victory and overcome the artificial lines of division. The flames have been stoked for our division for centuries. Today, we wash out the flames of division with our shed blood collectively and we declare, we decide the fate of America's future. And no 
white supremacy and no gun-toting hate monger can keep us on our knees forever. So here's what we're gonna do. Collectively, collectively, we are gonna go to Georgia. Collectively, we are gonna get rid of that white supremacist bigoted sheriff. Yes. Yes. Collectively. Yes. Collectively. Yes. Collectively, we are gonna go to Washington and demand real gun reform in this nation. Yes. Collectively, together. As we marched and declared Black Lives Matter together, we will march and declare Asian Lives Matter together. And together, we will decide the future of New York City its leadership, its direction. Together we will rebuild America. We will rebuild New York. We will rebuild a bridge that has been torn down by hate. Together, as our blood mingles in the streets, together, as our history is bound together, so is our future and the future of our children. They are bound together. Let us not fail the future by allowing this moment to slip unchallenged and unconquered. <coughs> Together, love is the key to power. Love of one another is the key to power in this nation. We declare today to white supremacists all across America and right here in New York City. The days and long nights of division have ended and America's bright morning is right upon us and we will carry it across the finish line together, no justice. No justice. No justice. What do we want? What do we want? What do we want? When do we want it? When do we want it? When do we want it? The key to power is love. That's something to meditate on. Thank you so much, Minister, for providing those words. And in the spirit of making sure that this is an issue that we need to address from the city on up, from our communities on up, in the spirit of holding our leadership accountable, in the spirit of making sure that something comes out of this pain, it is my pleasure to introduce our mayor, Bill de Blasio. Thank you. Everybody, we, we are confronting right now a terrorism being directed at Asian American communities. Let's be clear, a terrorism, a fear that has been created and emanated from Washington DC and it was state sponsored. And now look at the fear, look at the pain in our communities. We must confront it. The city of New York stands as one with all Asian Americans here in New York City and around the country. But listen, we need, we need people to come forward who have been victimized and attacked. We need to know. And we call upon everyone. Go to do? Asian hate. What are you going to do? Join our effort what are you to stop going to do? Asian hate together. And this is a city that will not to tolerate hatred. This is a city that will never allow hatred. Together we will overcome it. Thank you. God bless you all. Go home. All right, y'all. There's a lot of energy here tonight. All right. But now here's the thing. Here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, though. 
What leads to power? Love. 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 We can't forget that. All right. Out of this pain has to come something. And to that point, the work that we do and the work that our partners do is intimately connected to the experiences of the people we serve. Our next speakers will reflect on the work being done and where the work goes from here within our communities and beyond. The organizations that are doing work in our communities to address gender violence, to address systemic inequities facing our immigrant and Asian American communities are often the first place our community members go for support. To that end, Asian Americans for Equality has been a steadfast partner in our work to address systemic inequities facing our community, like building affordable housing, helping to build community assets through economic empowerment and community development when traditional banks aren't in our communities to begin with. It's my pleasure to introduce Asian Americans for Equality Co-Executive Director Thomas Yu to provide some remarks. Hello everyone. Thank you everyone for coming out today. My name is Thomas Yu. I'm the co-executive director of Asian Americans for Equality. We were founded nearly 50 years ago, right in the heart of Chinatown. Our founders were young activists, many like you, who were inspired by the black civil rights movements of the 60s and learned to organize and rally for equal opportunity and justice for all our communities. And if you come here today and understand why Asian lives matter, now you also understand why black lives matter. They open the doors for all of us. And we are all here together when we step up for one another that when we are all when we are attacked, we are all attacked. I just want to say that 50 years ago, when our founders started the organization, and even to this day, we are still having the same issues. We don't have affordable housing in our communities. We don't have access to good jobs. Our small businesses are struggling. Our seniors need help. We need more mental health services. And it's not just this past year. Like I said, we've been talking about this for 50 years. Right now, we are seeing one of the biggest collapses of our local neighborhoods because of COVID. Our small businesses, our immigrant small business, our mom and pops, they can't open. Our people are put out of work. And we have a crisis of hidden homelessness and Asian poverty that never gets highlighted. We are treated as invisible when we are 1.2 million people in this city. If we were a city, if Asian Americans, Asian New Yorkers were a city, we'd be in the top 10 biggest cities in the United States. We are not invisible. We're not. So I hope the mayor is still listening. Our community is in pain. We need the resources. We need the resources to rebuild uh -huh. together. <laughs> and we will step up when other communities are also in need. Let us not forget that. And I just want to end by saying that, hey, I had a bad day too. All right? <laughs> You know what I'm going to do when I have a bad day? I'm going to reach out to my friends, my families, and my community and say, what can I go out and do for you? Yeah. I'm going to go to other communities and say, how are you doing? What can I do for you? All right? I'm not going to go out and shoot people. And we're going to make our bad day into a better tomorrow for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom.
and it speaks so much to the work that we need to do internally and a lot of the work that we need to fight for to address the systemic inequities that we're navigating against externally. But, I, but we need to bring up something that's been an underlying current this entire time. Four of those whose lives were taken from them in Atlanta were Korean. As we learn more about the victims, learn more about their lives and what brought them here, we continue to recognize and connect so much of our community narrative in and to their experience. Korean American Family Services Center, one of our member organizations, has been a con constant presence in the Korean community and a steadfast presence in city immigrant and direct service advocacy. As the pandemic raged and demand skyrocketed for their services in the community, to say nothing of a budget that hasn't been raised, KAFSC kept their doors open to support victims of domestic violence and to meet the needs of Korean immigrant women like those who lost their lives in Atlanta on Tuesday. It's my honor to pass the mic to someone who knows that the key to power is love, Jihei Fisher, KAFSC's Executive Director. Hello, everyone. My name is Jihei Fisher, the Executive Director at the Korean American Family Service Center, also known as KAFSC. I would like to thank Joe and you and the Asian American Federation for providing this really important space for us to speak up and speak out. The KFSC is deeply, deeply saddened, shocked, and angered by Wednesday's mass shooting. As an organization that serves Asian immigrant survivors who were and are victims of human trafficking, domestic violence, and sexual assault, this recent tragedy feels too close to home. The shooter targeted Asian-operated businesses and martyred eight innocent women, six of whom were Asian descent and four of whom ethnic Korean. The shooter did not have just a bad day. It was a carefully orchestrated violence against women. It was a, a senseless attack against Asian Americans. While COVID-19 has affected us all, Asians and Asian Americans have been disproportionately hurt by the ongoing public health and economic crisis. In addition, on the unwarranted attacks against members of our community and add another layer of trauma. These victims could have been among the immigrant survivors that KFSC serves day to day. These women who work long days in massage parlors, spas, and beauty salons just to make ends meet. These women time and time again are at a systematic disadvantage. These women are our mothers, our aunties, our sisters, our daughters, our loved ones. So stop spitting at us, stop cursing at us, stop stabbing us, stop killing us, stop Asian hate. Yes, please.
Thank you so much, Jihei, for speaking of the work you do and this work still left to be done. And just as KAFSC, the Brooklyn Chinese American Association is fighting the same fight. They've been at the forefront of our fight against anti-Asian xenophobia, giving voice to a community that has so often gone unacknowledged when its voice was more critical than ever, especially in moments like right now. It's my pleasure to introduce the Executive Director of the Brooklyn Chinese American Association, Paul Mock. Right, Paul. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Mack, President and CEO of the Brooklyn Chinese American Association. Uh, really happy to see so many of you that are, that are here today. Uh, and thank you for the uh, Asian American Federation for uh, really co coordinating the opportunity for all, uh, all of us. Uh, I just want to say that um, there's a long history of uh, anti-Asians in this country. And, um, you know, from uh, Georgia, New York City, Brooklyn, any place else, we are really seeing uh, harassments and racial discrimination that are really hurting our community and everyone. Um, of course, uh, seeing uh, ever since the uh, pandemic, uh, we see the uh, the bias cases have been increasing uh, throughout the country, especially in New York City. But however, I'm sorry to tell you that the numbers, even though they are high, but however, many, many more are being underreported. So um, what we do is that uh, we hear from our community every day, uh, people are being harassed, uh, people are, you know, being pushed and, and things in that nature and uh, unfortunately it's really happening every day and we are just not seeing the end of it yet. And uh, of course, uh, the past administration uh, with their disinformation or misinformation uh, basically is not really helping. So we are really hoping that we are able to uh, make the correction of it by doing it together. Uh, I also want to um, take this opportunity to invite everyone to really take a look at the big picture. Uh, all the contributions that the Asian Americans have been making to the city, the Brooklyn, uh, the United States of America. Um, we are all in this together. So I really hope that uh, by really working together, we will be able to really um, stick together and to really uh, have our voice heard. Uh, I think this is a very, very crucial moment and uh, as sad as it is now, um, uh, uh, we are happy to see that so many of you are really coming out and really supporting the Asian community. So once again, thank you for uh, coming out. Thank you for the opportunity uh, for us to speak and uh, to gather together. Once again, thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Our community-based organizations continue to lead by example. They're fighting day in and day out to deliver critical, culturally competent services to our immigrant communities while reflecting the women and men and children most in need of these services. And they're doing it on a shoestring budget, might I add. Demand has skyrocketed since the pandemic and their budgets have not. Korean Community Services is the largest Korean serving social service organization that supports all ages, especially seniors. It also has the only state licensed Korean mental health clinic in the state. It's my honor to introduce Executive Vice President of KCS, Myung Mi Kim, to offer a few remarks on the work being done in our community and how we move forward together. Thank you so much bring me to speak this big opportunity for me. We grave over the continuous lose of Asian lives and express our deepest condolences to the family and the community who have lost loved ones. I grew up being educated not to cause problem quietly. Also, I teach my children to not make any harm to others. However, as I saw this time hate Asian crime, we had enough. This is the first time I speak publicly. I never speak out. I never speak out. Our culture, 
Doctor, do not speak. Do not make problem. I never ever speak loudly. I'm so sorry, but tonight. Tonight you speak! Yes, I speak! That was one of those moments where everyone underneath the mask, you could tell everyone was smiling just a little bit. <laughs> Thank you so much for those words. And, and you know, I hate to take the turn, but I mean, we have to acknowledge that immigrants lost their lives in Atlanta. New Americans who sought a better life. New Americans who are seeking out services just like KCS, just like BCA, just like KFSC provide. That their lives ended as they did is a tragic reminder that to be an immigrant in this country is an act of daily courage. To be an immigrant in this country is an act of daily courage. The New York Immigration Coalition has been the loudest and strongest advocate for the rights of Asians and all immigrants. They have been our community's allies and advocates through thick and thin. And in this time of mourning, as we look forward to the work still to be done, I'm thankful to have Murata Wauda, the co-executive director of the New York Immigration Coalition, here to share this space and offer some remarks. Right. Let's give it up for AAF. We can do better than that. Let's give it up for the Asian American Federation. What does community look like? So I say, this, what does community look like? You respond, this is what community looks like. What does community look like? What does community look like? Our safeties and solidarity, brothers and sisters. Just a few weeks ago, we rallied with the Asian American Federation in Battery Park. We rallied against the rise in anti-Asian violence here in the city and across the state and the nation. And what we see is the continual rise at the root of hate and violence and systemic racism is one thing, and it's white supremacy. We cannot talk about reforming systems that were built that were never built for us or our communities. So when people advocate for more policing, it's policing our own people. We're gonna over police black and brown communities. We keep us safe. Our communities keep us safe. There is safety in our solidarity with each other. We've seen hate crimes and hate violence increase not just over the past year, not just over the past five years, but for decades. Where you allow division, you allow violence. And when we are united, nothing can stop us. I wanna just say a couple of words to our elected officials who spoke before me. We need action. That's right. We need action. 
What action do we need? We need investments in our communities. We need to support the community organizations on the ground already working in our communities. We need to provide language appropriate mental health services. We need to provide resources for community led healing. We need to center victim services and fund them. The New York Immigration Coalition is proud to stand tonight in vigil with you all and with the Asian American Federation. We are all we got. We are literally all we got. We are in this together. What does community look like? What does community look like? Thank you everyone. Have a good night. Take care of each other. My name is Murata Wauda and I am the co-executive director of the New York Immigration Coalition. Thank you, Murad. I need a reminder. What does community look like? This is what community looks like. What does community look like? This is what community looks like. Thank you. Thank you so much, Murad. This is an all of us issue and requires all of us to do the individual work in conjunction with broader community advocacy. Long after this mic is gone, we're going to have to be keeping up the same asks, holding people accountable, and making sure things get done because Tuesday isn't going to be easily forgotten, and we need to keep it that way. As Interim Executive Director of the Arab American Association of New York, our next speaker has been a leading advocate for our immigrant communities. As a leader of the leading Arab social services organization, Marwa knows too well the pain of being invisible and being vilified for who she is. Please welcome Marwa Janani to the mic. I'm Marwa Janini, the Executive Director of the Arab American Association of New York. Arab and Muslim communities worldwide know all too well what it is like to be demonized, scapegoated, and stereotyped. At AAANY, we seek to uplift all communities who have been attacked and marginalized by white supremacy, by systems of power that reject their humanity and their worth. Today, our hearts go out to our Asian American brothers and sisters all over the country, and especially in Georgia, for the violence that has been done to them and the losses they have endured. COVID-19 has exposed once and for all the systematic fault lines and failures that so many in our, in our country have long tried to deny. It has been a year of reckonings, and while many of them have been public and painful, one of the most severe has been outside of the view of millions of Americans. This past year, while the eyes of the nation were focused on overcrowded hospitals and acts of police brutality, quietly on street corners and in homes across the country, Asian Americans began feeling more and more unsafe in communities they had called home for years. It started with boycotts of Asian-owned businesses. It escalated into verbal and then physical harassments on the streets, with perpetrators emboldened by the hate rhetoric being spewed from the nation's highest office. And on Tuesday in, in, in Atlanta, the year-long cycle of public hate for Asian Americans reached its inevitable next step with the deaths of six innocent Asian American women. While the investigators point to the sh shooter's sexual attitudes as a primary motor for the attack, we know that white supremacy, misogyny, and anti-Asian ideology cannot be disentangled from each other. Not with eight dead. Not with an entire community de devastated. It is no coincidence that the vast majority of Asian American victims of hate crime are women. Ugly and untrue stereotypes lead many white supremacists to view Asian women as a group they can easily dominate and control, often with tragic consequences. The pandemic didn't cause this hate. Since the first Asian immigrants arrived in America, exclusion acts and internment camps 
have taught Asian Americans that many in this country feel that there is no place here for them. But as politicians and media figures started talking about Kung flu and the Wuhan virus last year, those with hate in their hearts felt more empowered every day to finally express their attitude towards Asian Americans. Arab Americans know all too well what can happen when politicians and the media begin demonizing communities because of their ethnic backgrounds. And we know that the only way to fight back against it is to stand together in the face of this hate. Whether in Atlanta, El Paso, or New York, white supremacists will try to destroy and divide us, just like they always have in America. We cannot let them. We must stand in solidarity together with all of our brothers and sisters who fall victim to hatred. And today, we stand with the AAPI community all across this country, and especially in Georgia. Our Asian American brothers and sisters, we love you and we are here for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marwa. And again, this is just a reminder, as Marwa said, that the power is in our hands, the power is in all of these phones to take back our agency, to make sure that we have a say in what happens to our community. Next up, I'm excited to introduce Gavin Trinidad, a first-generation queer Filipino-American theater maker and writer who explores queerness, immigration, and ritual in his work as a reminder of how to express what we're going through through art. He's also a native New Yorker. Take it away, Gavin. Before I start, I ask that we just take a breath together for a moment. Breathe and breathe out. In Filipino tradition, there is a leader in the community, in the indigenous community called Babaylans. They were mostly women, some men, some of whom now using our language that we use today might have identified as queer or trans. And they were special people through whom they could open the doors to the spirit world to ask their ancestors for guidance and healing. So tonight, please humbly accept from a queer brown Filipino an offering. I do not know what my ancestors would have done. I do not know how to do this ritual like this. I just know that I cannot carry this burden alone. Habang my buhay, my pagasa. While there is life, there is hope. But what is missing in translation? The implication of you. As long as you live, there is hope because you are alive to make change, to affirm those who need to be seen, and to share your gift with others. You are the answer. You are special. You are a keeper of your family stories, traumas, and celebrations. So, this is an offering, a token of love and healing. A reminder that you are human. A reminder that there are terrible things in this world, but you can be hope. Just remember, practice self-love. Remember to grow. Hold yourself accountable. Be ready to be wrong. Be ready to do what's right. Now I ask all of you to look at each other. Look at the people here holding candles. Your chosen family. Habang mabuhay, 
my pag-asa. What is missing in the translation is the implication of us. As long as we live, there is hope because we are alive to make change, to affirm those who need to be seen and to share our gifts with others. We are the answer. We are special. We are keepers of our families, stories, traumas, and celebrations. So, once again, this is an offering, a token of love and healing, a reminder that we are human, a reminder that there are terrible things in this world, but we can be hope. And once again, I will say just a reminder, practice self-love, remember to grow, let us hold ourselves accountable, be ready to be wrong, be ready to do what's right. And as in Babylon tradition, keep sacred the gift of connecting with others as we are doing now. Reach out to loved ones, cherish our elders, help those who are young to grow, to survive, and to flourish. And if you're going to learn any Filipino word for tonight, the word I will leave you is mabuhay. 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 That is a Filipino hello, but that is not the real meaning of the word. When I say mabuhay, it actually, it tells someone to live, to live their life. So to us, I say mabuhay, mabuhay, mabuhay. mabuhay. Thank you. Can we just sit with that for a little bit and give him another round of applause, please? Thank you so much, Kevin. And as if to encapsulate this entire night, uh, just the sheer emotion of that, um, you know, this has been truly a difficult year for our community. And I'm not just talking about the three months in 2021, but all the way to the beginning of the pandemic last year. And this vigil has meant, was meant to help us grieve and process our experiences together. We, so right now we invite those of you who are willing to share what you're thinking and what you're feeling to line up by the stage so you can be invited up to speak your truth in this context we're sharing together. To hear from as many people as possible in the next 10 minutes, we ask that you keep your comments to one minute. We want to know how you feel and we know that's difficult in one minute but we want to get as many voices as possible and we just don't have the time but let's remember to give space to all of us to share grieve and possibly feel a little lighter together and it's not just 10 minutes and one minute apiece it's everyone here building community from here on out throughout the city take this opportunity to speak with each other it's not just a mic we need this to echo far beyond Tuesday, far beyond tonight, and into actionable items, actionable things that we can ask of our elected leaders to get done, but we need to make sure that this never happens again. As we cultivate a space of vulnerability and empathy here though, let us all make sure we're speaking our truth, actively listening, and respecting the context of why we're here together tonight. Good evening, everyone. My name is Winston Tran, and today I want to let you hear all my voice clear and loud. I was harassed twice during this pandemic on my way to pack food for those who quarantine. During this pandemic, I'm hurting. Our community are hurting. Every day I woke up at 4 a.m. just to find news that another Asian or anyone else that got hurt. Who will save us? The President Biden, Governor Cuomo, Bill de Blasio, or the police officers? We must save ourselves. From discriminations to a Muslim after 9-11, to George Floyd's situation to the 
to the Asian grandma got pushed and Benson hers, to the people who got killed on 8th Avenue, Brooklyn, Chinatown. It is an awakened moment for me and other community. It is unacceptable just because you have a bad day, you gotta kill people. I don't do that. When I have a bad day, I teach people. I teach my students how to do their work. We must unite it and show the world we are matter. We are not invisible. All human lives are matter regardless of the color of your skin. Haters, haters are foreigners. You need to go back to your own cave. I got pushed back every single day. People telling me I won't be able to make it. I won't be able to change the world. But guess what? I'm teaching my student every single day what good and what is right. Maybe I won't be able to change the world now, but one day I will make that history. You will hear my name. I don't care if you keep putting the rock in front of my path, but let me tell you something. The more rock that you put in front of my path, I will remove them. If I can't remove them, I will go around them and climb over it. It is unacceptable to kill Asian or anyone in this society. So stop all your hatred. It is unacceptable. And to all my brother and sister from all over the world, it doesn't matter what your skin color is. There is only one race, and that is human race! We must stand together. This is not, it's not okay. Just to take the camera out and put it on YouTube. It's not okay when somebody is getting hurt. You need to report. I got harassed twice. When I call the police officer, it goes unreported. I try to make the news and unfortunately I am nobody in front of a lot of people's eyes. I am deeply hurt and cut by a lot of people in the community as well. And I'm so glad that my voice is heard right now. And you will continue to hear my voice in City Council 2021. Winton Tran. Thank you. I'm a civil rights lawyer. 
And for over a decade, I have fought against discrimination, racism, excessive force. And you know what the biggest problem is? It's the fact that the powers that be refuse to acknowledge these problems for what they are, white supremacy. If that shooter was a black man, a Latino, a Muslim, what would that press conference have been like? Would, he, would we have heard how he, they were having bad days? How they were just struggling with things? They would have been demonized, torn apart. Every bad thing that ever happened would have been plastered all over the screens. But none of that happened. But we knew what it was before we even finished reading that first headline. And instead of the truth, they tried to convince us that it was something else. Yes. Yes. Just like with George Floyd, we all watched that video and in response, they tried to convince us something else was going on. If we're going to expect them to do anything for us, especially the law enforcement, they must acknowledge these dangerous situations for what they are, the yes. empowerment, and maintenance of white supremacy in this country. Yeah. And it's just got to stop. Plain and simple. If we're going to expect our safety, if we're going to expect stability, it's not going to happen without the truth. It's not going to happen without facing the problem. And so let's force that. Let's force them to face what's actually going down. And then we, the community, will do something about it. Thank you so much for allowing me to be in this space with you tonight. How's it going, guys? My name is Rob. Rob Chen. Chen's my last name. My Cantonese name is Chen Yerming, and I am my skin is golden, and I'm proud and outspoken. I just have one quick little verse for you guys that I wrote, and I hope to share it with you guys. These days I cannot go to sleep without some heavy breathing. I see this more policing. I walk outside and I see people holding signs and shouting from the speakers. I think I need to take some time to get over my demons. It's time to break these sneakers. It's time to break these sneakers. Bring out the winter time, it's winter season. It's ice cold, they deporting my folks. Ain't no Geico ensuring my people won't be attacked by some asshole who never got his stimulus check. And so he's spinning in debt, no way he's paying his rent The system's broken and it's breaking our backs It's such a labyrinth, you got him here just asking Cause I don't have the answers Is this how it all ends or will it be another chapter? I'm bleeding from the pen in my hand And if you're listening, I hope that you are safe with your fam How is your mom and dad? I know it's been a while, but you're still my friend One day I hope to see you again Life is more than what we see I close my eyes, I'm on my knees. I pray for you and everyone, so please stay strong and carry on. I make a vow for you and I. I'll be right there if you gon' cry. I know it's hard, but life goes on, so please stay strong and carry on. I love you guys. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Christopher Liu, and first off I'd like to say thank you all for being out here today. So growing up, I faced a lot of adversity, and I was picked on a lot, and throughout middle school, during lunch, I actually sat by myself um, for the whole year, and only two people had approached me, asking me if if, they, if, they, if I wanted to sit with them. And, and over the past few weeks, and even the last year during the pandemic, um, after seeing all of the hatred towards the people of color, hatred towards all the Asian Americans, I've started to lose faith in humanity. So I stand before you today vulnerable because I, I needed a purpose to live. I needed a purpose to, to, to believe that there's the light at the end of the tunnel. And to see all of you here from all different races, all different parts of the world united, this is my purpose. This gives me hope and it gives me it gives me strength to be able to to be able to to be able to
to fight through this because the hate, the hate stops now. The hate stops now. I, I'm scared for my family. I'm scared for my friends' families. I'm scared for my future kids. I got off school buses when I was growing up crying because of the things that people said to me. And I, I, I stand before you today because I will not, I will not let this happen anymore. I do not want to, to hear my future ch children being ridiculed for how they look. We are all, like everyone else said, we are all part of the human race. And just please, please don't give up. Thank you all for being out here. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, thank you. So we have time for one more speaker. I, I really want to thank everyone who had the courage to come up here and speak their truth from our youngest participants today. And uh, you know everyone who showed up. Uh, we have time for one more speaker, but I do want to make sure to mention that we have safety resources that we've created. Their e-resources are on our website. They've been translated into five languages, I believe. We also have booklets in the back. And um, yeah, last speaker before we uh, have concluding remarks. My name is Narina. I'm 13 years old and I go to Hoboken Charter School. I'm in the 8th grade. Right, I identify as a South Asian woman. I am Indian. I am second generation Indian. My grandparents immigrated here for a better life. And it's so hard to believe that I'm standing here in front of you having to fight for a better life for my children, my grandchildren, and everybody who comes after me. When I look at this crowd, I don't see race. We are, excuse me, I do see race because that is who we are. It is part of, of our personalities. It, I de it's who we are. I am South Asian. It shapes every fiber of my being. But also, when I look out in this crowd, I see America, I see the true spirit of what America was meant to be, and it is yeah, true. That's right. yeah, that's right. The system wasn't built for us, it wasn't built for people of color. When we stand alone, when we stand apart, we are the minority. But when we stand together, we are the majority. We outnumber those who are going to stand against us. We outnumber white supremacists. So I fight for everybody in this crowd, everybody who feels, everybody who feels discriminated against, everybody who feels like they face some sort of adversity in their life. Because nobody deserves to feel that way. Nobody deserves to be treated like Asian Americans are being treated right now, like African Americans are being treated right now. Our past was dark, our present is dark, but I have to believe that our future will be brighter. Thank you, thank you. And uh, so we have, okay, I promise one more speaker. I promise, just one more speaker. Hi, my name is Yeru. We have talked a lot tonight about being invisible and having a voice. And there's one very important way we can all have a voice, and that is to vote. All of us in the Asian American community get your friends and family to register to vote, and then come out to vote. And then once we've done that, we need to form alliances with other communities of color, blacks, the black community, the Latinx, Muslims, all of the other communities that have been scapegoated, trampled upon and rendered invisible because only together at the voting booth and together can we overcome white supremacy. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone who did speak, who came here to the middle of Union Square and shared their vulnerability with all of us. I want to thank you again for the members of the community who spoke today. And I also want to thank some of the elected officials who are here, State Senators Kavanaugh and Hoyleman, 
the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer is here, various numbers of council member, uh, council seat candidates, and council members, uh, council member Antonio Reynoso comes to mind. So a lot of electeds came here because they know this is important. They know this is important. They know something needs to get done. And they were willing to hear our community organizations speak. They were willing to hear our community members speak. And I hope they're ready to be held accountable because we're ready to get something done because we can't have Tuesday happen again. We can't have it happen here. And we can't have all of these experiences that we've heard from all of these community members continue to happen and then just dissipate to the media either. Now, I don't want to take away from the energy that these community members brought here tonight, so I just want to hand it off to our chair, our, our board chair of the Asian American Federation to give some concluding remarks to what really is a, what has been a remarkable night. Thank you. Thank you all for hanging uh, in there this cold evening. It's sad that we had to come together yet again. But I'm Marjorie Shu, board chair of the Asian American Federation. We hear you, the little voices, the tall voices, the soft voices, the big voices. And now that our voices are raised, we need to keep raising them again and again. Uh, Asian Americans need to drop the cloak of invisibility, and then together across all of our communities, let us work toward a better, brighter future where we have trust and respect, safety, protection, love, and I hope you all get home safely tonight. Keep well, keep those you love and your community safe and in your arms, and have a good night. Thank you so much.